Yeah, that's no. Fuck that shit. Fuck this too fucking American dude. I'm going fucking old school. Splatter, Giallo, Cannibal, Getting Even With Dad. These are just a few of the seemingly infinite ways to convey human suffering on screen, be it at the hands of a stab-happy loon, or whatever this is. In 1997, Michael Haneke flipped the script when he unleashed Funny Games, a meta-subversion of horror tropes that questions our want for violence in art. It's an intentionally miserable experience, one far more likely to leave you with a sense of guilt than any carnal satisfaction. 1999's audition similarly turned stomachs with its protracted, plodding dread, building towards borderline unwatchable agony. Both films treated their savagery with a detached, clinical eye. The real dirt was laid at the doorstep of the viewer themselves, each a willing participant in the unfolding cruelty. English language filmmakers, taking note of this upswing in international extreme cinema, stripped away the art house idling and moral quandaries while keeping the sadistic crescendos of gore. With this shift towards shock, torture porn was born, and with it, a near fetishistic dwelling on misery, albeit polished up like a mid market thriller. Saw devolved from the primordial ooze of Seven into a mindless meld of puzzles, plot twists, and punctured arteries. Throw in a few spit-shined remakes of exploitation favourites to fill out the ranks, and you had a steady stream of blood to keep audiences flowing to the multiplex. The term itself, torture porn, is seen by genre enthusiasts as reductive, a snide disregard for anything that sets out to challenge an audience's thresholds. The new French extremity movement, which is something of a sister genre, has come under similar scrutiny for its relentless nastiness. The new French extremity's allegorical intentions push taboos in order to highlight, challenge, and antagonise the discussion of socio-political issues. It may seem like semantics, but I wouldn't lump in frontiers or martyrs in with something like the collector. The difference is cultural context and overall intent. Amongst the head wounds and hacksaws, there was an enfant terrible of trash rising to prominence over in the United States. The leader of the splat pack, Eli Roth. After the cult success of the darkly comedic Cabin Fever, Roth slid under the wing of one Quentin Tarantino and embarked on his magnum opus of ugliness, Hostel. This series had an undeniable blunt force impact, with legions of imitators in its wake. It's arguably one of the reasons straight to DVD sections are swollen with no budget knockoffs of fingernail pulling ballyhoo. At the time, I was 18 years old, working my way through the Tartan Asia Extreme Bat catalogue and getting caught up with the video nasty era I'd missed out on. I thought the original Hostel was relatively well made, slick, and kind of shocking. In retrospect, let's just say hindsight's a harsh mistress. In Hostel, three backpacking bros, Josh, Ollie, and Paxton, travel mainland Europe in search of sex, weed, and… nope, that's it. Lured to Slovakia by promises of beautiful women, they shack up in the titular Hostel. The twist? It's all a front for the Elite Hunting Club, an organisation where wealthy psychopaths pay to torture and kill hapless tourists. Hostel Part 2 begins soon after the previous entry, with Paxton now free and clear hiding far from his captors, who immediately find and kill him. Cut to Beth, Lorna, and Whitney. And if you know where this is going, congratulations, you've realised it's the exact same plot as the first movie. Foregoing a cinematic release, Eli Roth's direct involvement, or much in the way of canonical or artistic worth, Hostel Part 3 asks, what if you made The Hangover worse, then tried to fill in the gaps with half-remembered scenes from Swingers, then gave up altogether and just had a bunch of people get killed in a room? If you like the Hostel films, more power to you. Here at Inframe Out, there's no real interest in pulling apart the work of others for some smug satisfaction. Rather, this is a critique built from a genuine love for this important, entertaining, and outright essential genre. There are certainly a few stray diamonds in the guts of the Hostel trilogy, but without a screenplay, rule set, or characters to engage with intellectually or laugh along with knowingly, none of it really works.
While there are exceptions, I mean there always are, many of the films under the torture porn umbrella simply don't try that hard or plumb the same depths as comparable but more high-minded horror. Not every film has to have an overarching message, but bear pills tend to go down easier when they have a point. For comparison's sake, Martyr's Brutality works as a religious parable, examination of childhood trauma, condemnation of violence towards women, a challenge to how we define strong female characters, and a skewed look at transcendentalism and belief. Hostel pays lip service to broader themes, exploiting the citizens of a country that itself was built by exploitation, the inherent violence of capitalism, and power as a construct, without fully committing to anything. Loftier ideas are muddled, botched, or completely contradicted by writing that favours empty guff over intelligent discourse. This is a series marred in xenophobic generalisations. Slovakian and Eastern Bloc natives are painted almost exclusively as soulless murderers or willing cogs in a network of suffering. With his defence, Roth only makes the matter worse. Americans do not even know that this country exists. My film is not a geographical work, but aims to show Americans' ignorance of the world around them. So, first he tars all Americans as culturally insensitive in order to excuse his own failings as a storyteller, then doubles down by stating the film is a product of their ignorance, not his own. Whenever Roth deals with sensitive issues, he ends up pissing into the wind. The Green Inferno tips its hat to white saviour narratives and colonialism before steamrolling right into non-Western ideals equals savage barbarism, while Death Wish is pro-fascist propaganda espousing just how important it is for rich white men to have guns. Occasionally, Roth does display moments of genuine craft within the muck and mire, albeit fleetingly. Subtitles aren't provided for foreign exchanges, leaving us equally as oblivious as our protagonists. In English, please. It all reaffirms that us, the Western audience, are the foreign presence in this situation. No concessions will be given to placate our need for resolution or understanding. In Hostel, as Paxton pleads with his captor in German, we're left scrambling to decipher the exchange based on context cues and physical performance alone. Fear of the unknown is the most powerful weapon in a horror director's arsenal, and it's in these brief moments where the potential of this concept is almost realised. It's when we get back to the English language when stumbles turn into outright freefall. Roth's dialogue idles somewhere between frat boy belligerence and on the nose inference. I sure hope you like repeated parallels between the many ways we exploit one another. The pain to go into a room to do whatever you want to someone isn't exactly a turn up. Message! They go crazy for any foreigner. You just. Method. This is something who gave me five, so I would not go hungry. The fuck is he talking about? Are these clever nods, or are they just bad writing? The second one, it's bad writing. It takes nuanced storytelling principles and wields them like a kid who's found his dad's gun. Subtlety isn't the series' strong suit, and that isn't inherently a problem. The reason it's so damaging here is that these films cannot make up their mind as to whether they're terrifying realistic subversions or trauma slapstick. The torture of Josh is notable for its restraint, with ear-aching sound design and trembling reactions over gratuitous money shots. It's a fantastic implementation of the Reservoir Dogs school of filmmaking, but it's a frustrating exception rather than the rule. The rest of the film is all severed fingers and popped eyeballs. If Hostel is indecisive with its tone, part two is a tug of war between oh so serious and outright comedic farce. The tonal clusterfuck comes to a head when the film ends with children playing football with a severed human head to the sounds of a jaunty gypsy folk number. It's possibly the least fitting end to a dour, depressing, slow, boring procession of muted colours and miserable death. And it's just plain stupid. 
That's one of the key failings of the Hostel trilogy as a whole. Intelligence, or the near absence of it. From the problematic world Roth builds to the people who populate it, indifference, ignorance and incomprehensible logic make each new instalment a sullen slog. Filmmaking is notoriously difficult. From development and planning to the final days of post-production, it's a labour of love where creators are spinning any number of proverbial plates at any given time. Now and then, things are bound to slip through the cracks. Mistakes are made, we move on. There are few things less interesting in film criticism than listing goofs or minor plot holes. So trust me when I say that this goes far beyond nitpicking. The gaps of logic and narrative reasoning in the Hostel series are open wounds, growing ever more infected with each convoluted scene. Let's start with the glaringly obvious. The Elite Hunting Club would be discovered and disbanded immediately. Affluent Americans routinely vanishing in the same place, having come into contact with the exact same people, each one carrying traceable cell phones, credit cards and passports. Within a week, Interpol would be carpet bombing the building. As the trilogy continues, we're told the organisation is comprised of hundreds of employees, thousands of clients and countless knowing accomplices. All it would take is one wealthy dirtbag trying to get a bargain for a plea deal, or one disgruntled henchman blowing the whistle and the entire operation goes up in flames. How do I know this for certain? In the third film, one phone call to the police is enough to burn down the whole operation. I am too smart! I am too smart! SMRT! In Hostel, it's established you can't bargain your way out of an untimely death. Well, not until Hostel Part 2, where this exact thing happens. Just name your fucking price! Trust me, I got it! This is just one case of rules being established only to be immediately ignored. One of Hostel's revelatory moments comes as we discover victims are picked from a menu with different prices depending on the origin of the meat. It's a suitably horrifying reveal. Now, Hostel Part 2 tells us that it's actually just eBay for human bodies, with the victims sold off to the highest bidder. Also in Hostel Part 2, the elite hunting club murders one of their own members because he attempts to leave while his victim is merely mortally wounded, but not entirely dead. It's stupid, but if it's in keeping with the film's internal logic, I'll bite. Just a few moments later, another recently welcomed member also leaves without having struck the fatal blow on their victim, but this time it's okay? Wrong! By the third film, all bets are off. Well, not literally. As of Hostel Part 3, we learn that a lucrative spin-off of the formula has now been developed, where patrons can place bets on how the torture will proceed. What weapons will they use? When will the time of death be? So yeah, the most flawed and easy to rig system of gambling ever conceived. Thematically, these films aren't the sharpest tools in the shed, and with no logical rule set to cushion the landing so we can't fall back on intellectual ideation as any form of defence. It also doesn't have the true schlock-stained carnage to lump them in with the non-stop gore of the grindhouse crowd. So is it a series of dumb fun or smart shocks? It's neither, existing in a nebulous dishwater limbo, too silly to shock, too boring for schlock. Do the characters outshine their setting at least? Do they fuck? Let's divide our typical horror cast into two broad categories, disposable heroes and emotional investments. For all those slasher classics, we need meat for the grinder. After all, Hatchet here needs some vaguely sketched nobodies to pull apart. They serve a function. The pain train keeps rolling as wave after wave of these dum-dums march to their deaths. Now, think of your favourite works in the rich and expansive lineage of the horror genre. The classics, The Shining, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Thing, even more recent efforts such as Eden Lake and Hereditary. Their common element, characters we care about. We need a vessel for audience empathy, where we can hang our collective hopes on their survival. 
The terror comes from their circumstances, the weight in your gut as they struggle to survive. The terminal flaw with Hostel and its sequels is that none of them can decide which to hang their hat on. The straight-faced brutality and depressive tone don't carry the hallmarks of slasher silliness, but were given no reason to care. With the actual mindless violence taking up barely a quarter of the running time, we're going to be spending a lot of time living with these folks before we get to the dying. In Hostel, we have Ollie, a total piece of shit who gets decapitated by the end of the first act. Josh, the least despicable of the bunch whose sensitivity is berated, mocked and exploited as an unforgivable weakness. And our hero, Paxton. So what can we say about Paxton? He's homophobic. Hey, you know what? I don't know why you guys are waiting. It's a fucking f**k fest in there. Xenophobic, entitled, and deeply misogynistic. God, I hope bestiality is legal in Amsterdam because that girl's a fucking hog. His arc? We feel bad because his equally vacuous friends die and he gets quite hurt. So what lesson does he learn? Violent retribution and revenge are the answer. Okay... It's an inescapable void of hackneyed writing, dude bro cliches and gay panic jokes that are supposed to endear us to the plight of a self-proclaimed law student who doesn't have the smarts to think this location is somewhat suspicious. Are you some kind of moron? Yeah, but- Hey, yeah, it's- Still, Hostel insists on our investment in Paxton, so much so they bring him back for the sequel. Maybe this is the turning point, where Paxton sees the error of his ways and grows a third dimension, or succumbs to the hate and hurt he has endured, thus dialing in on the psychological impact of murder, survivor's guilt, and post-traumatic personality shifts. It's been done before to great effect. It worked in Terminator 2, it worked in Halloween 2018. Oh wait, he's dead. Dies in the first 10 minutes. Thanks for rendering the events of the entire first film completely redundant. Yay. Killing off an established character can work. As controversial as it was, one of the best things Alien 3 did from a character standpoint was kill off Newt and Hicks from the get-go. The reason it falters here is because Paxton was an unlikable turd, so there's no real emotional weight to his death. If you didn't invest in Paxton and wanted more rounded individuals to root for, better luck elsewhere. We're just gonna gender swap the previous film's one-dimensional placeholders. The move from male to female protagonists in Hostel Part 2 could have really hammered home themes of power dynamics and empowerment, or at least given Roth a second stab at combating the rampant misogyny of Hostel. Again though, we're just treated to tropes upon tropes with no sign of self-awareness and lazy contrived motivations. I'm not kidding, our hero's main call to action is people using the word cunt. What did you say to me? Forget the fact our friends were bled dry by demented one percenters, foul language really isn't becoming of a young woman's sensitive disposition. What? I fucking hate that word! Oh, you stupid American I fucking lost my temper! Hostel Part 3 doesn't even have the pretense of well-drawn characters, which sort of works in its favour. At least without the doom and gloom aesthetics and self-serious moralising, you can enjoy someone getting their face sliced off with a few beers and your brain on standby. Without the tongue-in-cheek fun of coffin fodder morons or well-honed individuals to hold our breath for, what have we got? Ill-mannered mannequins that take too long to die and do nothing of worth while they're alive. It's funny how things work out, or in the case of this series, don't. You could absolutely make a good film out of this premise, or at least an entertaining one. Yeah, it was undoubtedly significant to the popularization of mid-2000s mainstream gore, Google torture porn, and it'll still dominate the results. Jesus Christ, whatever you do, do not Google torture porn. I cannot stress that enough. All I'm saying is this. If the Hostel series isn't smart, and it isn't scary, there's nothing to engage with on a human level, and there's no logic behind the wheel, then what do they have to offer? Pain and misery? In that case, I'd rather watch something significantly sillier, or much more intelligent. Horror is so broad and so bold, there's no sense writing off extreme cinema as all guts and no glory. 
It's a rich tapestry of good, bad, outstanding, and, well, the Hostel franchise. Maybe we just need to leave these dank basements behind and ask for a little more from our gore. This video has been a long time coming, and I really hope you enjoy it. If you'd like to join the Inframe Out Film Club or support the channel in any way, please click the Patreon link in the description, or feel free to share, like, and subscribe. An immense thank you to those who've already signed up, and to everyone who supported the channel over the last few months. Head down to the comments and let's discuss some better alternatives to this not very good franchise. We'll be back with better films next time. Until then, this is Inframe Out.